there. Hello, hello, buenos dias, guten tag. My name is Marian Pitters, and I'm delighted to be the facilitator for today's webinar. I'm here to introduce our expert speaker, moderate some questions from you, our audience members, and ensure that the webinars progress according to the schedule so that we respect everyone's time. But first, on behalf of McMaster University, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second webinar of the series, The Arctic, A Global Health Perspective. We have participants from all over Ontario, Canada, and the globe online today. Seven, 17 countries, including Russia, South Africa, Iran, and Thailand. We have graduate students, faculty from McMaster and partner institutions, as well as representatives from the World Health Organization, WHO, and some select invitees. Many of you are preparing to contribute your skills to Arctic Global Health. We welcome you all to today's compelling session. This webinar series explores diverse perspectives on Arctic Global Health. Despite documented health disparities between the circumpolar north and other regions, the Arctic remains an underrepresented area in global health research. This series offers a transdisciplinary look at key global health challenges and opportunities in the high north. A quick overview of the 10 webinars in our series can be found at the Global Health website. Today's session is webinar two, Environmental Determinants and Human Health in the Arctic. It features Dr. Chris Fergal from Trent University. Time has been built in for questions and discussions at the end of the presentation. Please use the chat tool to submit questions electronically at any time during Dr. Fergal's presentation. And note that while we may not be able to get to all of your questions, we will aim to address them afterwards on the Global Health website. This webinar series has been inaugurated by Dr. Andrea Bauman, the Associate Vice President of Global Health and Director of the WHO Collaborating Center in Primary Care Nursing and Health Human Resources at McMaster University. Andrea, will you please start us off with a few words about launching this webinar series, please? You may have to unmute yourself, Andrea. Thank you very much, Marianne, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We organized this speaker series to reflect the transdisciplinary, actually transglobal nature of both global health and our Arctic communities all around the world. Specifically, we're very interested in our own Arctic community, of course, Canada, but we're also very aware that it's a vast expanse and uh, represented by many, many people. I want to thank all of the series speakers, again, for their diverse expert perspectives, including Chris Fergal, who we'll hear from today. And especially, I'd like to thank our students for tuning in. We have many partners on the webinar from our Global Health Network, and we look forward to hearing their perspectives after the series concludes. It's been our privilege to launch this unique webinar series for you. And now over to you, Mary. Thanks, Dr. Bauman. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Chris Fergal. Dr. Chris Fergal is an Associate Professor of Indigenous Environmental Studies at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. Dr. Fergal's involvement in the North is extensive as co-founder and co-director of the Nazavik Center for Inuit Health and Changing Environments and a lead author on the Arctic Climate Impact Assessments. His work focuses on environmental health risk assessment, management, and communication in cooperation with Indigenous populations in the context of rapidly changing natural environments. When Chris is not working, you'll find him cross-country skiing, a pastime that this winter has taken over the Peterborough area. Chris, thank you for presenting for the next 30 minutes. I'll provide a one-minute reminder, and then we can move into a discussion with the participants' questions that come up in the chat section. Over to you now. Chris, I think you'll need to unmute yourself. Sorry. There we go. 
Can you hear me now? I sure can. Thank you. Excellent. And, and video is okay as well? Your video looks tremendous. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. So I'm going to uh, just switch over to my slides. Good morning, everybody. Um, and just make sure that I'm able to move through my slides. Okay, great. So good morning, everybody. And thank you, first of all, to the organizers for putting this session, the series together. Um, if you were with us last week, we had a great introduction and a really interesting introduction from a diversity of panelists. Um, and if we look at the series of speakers coming up in the, the coming weeks, I think um, what I will talk about today will touch a little bit on some of the things that they're going to go into greater depth on. And I'll, I'll try and highlight that for you. I'll, I'll make some, try and identify where some bridges exist. Um, the issue of environmental determinants um, for Arctic health is something that um, is not necessarily a, a career path that I chose out of my undergrad um, into graduate school. Um, it's something that I sort of came across and sort of grew into with the different research um, that I became involved in uh, in graduate studies. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that today. And I think that's important in the context of this bridge that's now being built and I think um, strengthening significantly between Arctic and the global health community. So if we look at the global health community historically, there's relatively little representation of Arctic health work and, and research um, represented there, despite the fact that many of the same themes and issues that you deal with as students and researchers and practitioners in the global health community uh, exist in, in Arctic settings. And it's, it's a discussion that we could have at some point in time as to why that, why that might be. I know coming up through grad school and through earlier years of my career, many of my supervisors and colleagues um, that were involved in Arctic health research looked at the Arctic as a unique and distinct region in the world, unique from other regions around the world, and essentially created a little bit of an Arctic health bubble to a certain degree. And it may very well be that that bubble through momentum and through sort of training of other graduate students grew in that way. And despite the fact that in the early, I think, to the mid-1980s, there were prominent Arctic health researchers that were identifying commonalities with the global health research community, talking about the Arctic and Arctic health as being health in a fourth world condition, third world conditions in developed nations. Um, and that being particularly the circumstance for indigenous populations in the circumpolar north. So I think it's timely that this bridge is being strengthened and that we have more global health researchers and thinkers coming into the Arctic health bubble and perhaps popping or opening up that bubble. We see that in even recently in the context of the Lancet, um, the, the health journal, medical health journal, that has created a commission on Arctic health as of last year um, and put on that commission um, commissioners that are also involved in the global health research community. So I think intentionally trying to build those bridges and build those bridges for research, but also for communication and learning. And they're supposed to be coming out with their commissioner's report um, later this year. One of the issues that we need to deal with when we talk about Arctic health and Arctic environmental health that I'll talk about today is this issue of which Arctic are we even speaking about. If we look at the map on the left, we have a number of biophysical definitions of what the Arctic might be. Whether we look at a 10 degree Celsius July isotherm or average temperature, where the Arctic tree line is, around the circumpolar north, which of course influences the ecology and settlement patterns of populations, where actually 60 degrees north or the Arctic Circle is, or even where the average permanent extent of ice is, of summer ice is um, in the Arctic. All of those could be potentially defined areas of the Arctic. 
You'll have a speaker coming in, I believe, next week from the Sustainable Development Working Group of the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council having four working groups, sustainable or five, sorry, Sustainable Development Working Group, the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program, Arctic Human Development uh, Report, um, CAF, or the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, and the Environmental Protection, uh, um, the Environmental Protection and, and Marine Group. And each of them for their uh, assessments have slightly different boundaries as well, based on political, ecological, and in some cases, scientific criteria. If we're talking about Arctic health, whether we talk about Arctic environmental health or whether we talk about public health, where we draw that line around the circumpolar Arctic is critically important. The region is vastly diverse where we have large metropolitan areas of hundreds of thousands of individuals, for example, in the Finno-Scandinavian and Siberian Arctic, and a pattern of relatively small and very much isolated smaller communities in something like the Canadian Arctic, for example, with some larger regional centers. Where we draw that line is important in terms of who we include in that definition and that discussion and that exploration of Arctic and Arctic health. What I'm gonna to do today in my talk is talk to you a little bit about my introduction, my journey into Arctic environmental health in particular, from graduate studies up to some of the work that I'm involved in today. Nice picture on the left of me, the first time actually that I was ever in an Arctic community as a master's student, wrapped up in my traditional caribou parka and, and pants and comics. Um, I actually was introduced to Arctic research as a wildlife biology graduate student doing my master's, interested in the relationship between these species, ring seals, polar bears, and Arctic fox, and was introduced to that through essentially working with Inuit hunters on the north end of Baffin Island in the Canadian Arctic. And in particular, one hunter that was very much sort of a mentor and a teacher to me, Eliak Nakatarvik, in the community of Arctic Bay or Ikpiaryuk, who was essentially teaching me about Arctic ecology through very much Inuit eyes. Through a series or turn of events, the scientific approach to the wildlife research that I was planning on doing for my research, for my, for my master's, had to get thrown out the window and we essentially had to design a project the first time I was in the community. And that ended up with me living with an Inuit family and traveling on the land, hunting and fishing on the land for four months one year and three months the following year, which dramatically impacted my understanding of the role of science, the nature of knowledge, the understanding of the environment and ways of knowing the environment and conducting research. And essentially through a process of immersion, I was able to learn about the things I was planning on learning from using the scientific method, but predominantly from more of an Inuit perspective. And one of the things that it did, and we spent sort of weeks at a time out on the land hunting and fishing and the, the Alayak Nakatarvik, the person that I was working with who was hired as my research guide and my assistant, but very much sort of my teacher. Um, after about probably four or five days in the community, we would go out hunting for five or six days at a time. And after the first couple of trips, would take nothing with us other than the gear we needed. We would take no, essentially no food supplies whatsoever. And Alayak was not worried because everything that he needed existed out on the land, out on the ice and out on the land. And very quickly, as a wildlife biology student, the list of species that I was fascinated to see, and it's a very rich and very vibrant and active area in the Canadian Arctic, um, became just as long as the list of species that I had eaten while I was in the North. Because essentially we were subsisting as Inuit did for thousands of years on the land based on the resources and based on the skills that Eliak had that had been passed down on to him. One of the things that this did for me as a wildlife biology student at the level of my master's was not only impart with me essentially a very different view on how to do research, 
but a very different view of the environment. It really showed me and instilled in me this notion of these resources around us that I thought were wildlife or environmental resources were actually health resources for Eliak, for his family, and for the community. They were all interrelated. They were all supporting and enriching health. And even today, when there was a store in town, when there was wage, econ wage economy going on because there was a mine nearby, there was still a phenomenally strong connection to the land. But at the same time, being caught in storms or traveling on very unstable sea ice may meant that that land was both a benefit but also, also potentially a risk or a hazard to health as well. So that project that I did turned into both an indigenous knowledge and a science project. And it got me interested in a number of different themes and really introduced me to this notion of environment as a determinant of health for Arctic peoples. So what I learned and what I was introduced to was these key themes in Arctic environmental research and Arctic environmental health research, the role of environment as a determinant of health. This notion of what knowledge are we talking about and therefore an introduction and the strength or the value of a transdisciplinary approach to research and learning. These issues of scale from local to global, these issues of equity within a community or outside of that community with a national population be it indigenous or non-indigenous. The very distinct difference in access to services for health, for environment, for wage earning economy and socioeconomic opportunities in a community, in a remote community like in the Canadian Arctic where I was. The issues of politics and power of who gets to say and who gets to make decisions about issues that affect individuals at the local scale. The socioeconomic disparities that exist um, that are, of course, common in other areas around the world, but that were front and center in the work I was doing and in my life in the community. And finally, this issue of the strong connection between culture and health and this notion of a more holistic view and understanding of health that was encompassing and much more inclusive of many other determinants than I was aware of and had been introduced to as a graduate student from a biology and then ultimately from an environmental health perspective. What this got me interested in was pursuing this area of environmental health after my master's in biology. And that's what I did. I went on to work after that, um, particularly around this issue of environmental health risk management and communication around an issue that I had been introduced to during the masters, but I hadn't necessarily focused on. And that was this notion of food safety and contaminants in the Arctic and food safety. And what we have in the Canadian Arctic and the circumpolar Arctic, in fact, is quite a unique circumstance with regards to global pollution deposition and human health or, or human exposure to uh, uh, environmental contaminants. So those sorts of things that we Spray, are spraying on fields or are emitting from smokestacks in more industrialized regions of the world are often light enough in the physical and chemical uh, sense to volatilize into the atmosphere, to get carried by cyclonic and anticyclonic air currents that circulate around the earth and get carried far, far away from their area of use or emission to eventually be scavenged out of the atmosphere and settle out in a colder environment, potentially the next year to warm up again, to volatilize and be carried even further into a colder environment. Where they eventually settle out and are not disturbed or it doesn't warm up enough for them to volatilize and get carried up into the atmosphere and be transported further north. Such that what we have is we have emissions in predominantly mid-latitude areas of a number of different environmental contaminants hopping up the globe or down the globe towards the poles through what's referred to as the grasshopper effect. And well, in the south, in, at, at the South Pole, um, in the Antarctic, 
that's not as much of an issue. It is for environmental biota, for environmental species, but not as much of an issue for human species. Whereas in the circumpolar Arctic, um, in the Northern uh, hemisphere, we have an issue where we still have thousands of individuals still subsisting off the land for a large portion of their daily diet, an element of their identity, a connection to tradition and culture, and an important part of livelihoods such that we have essentially sort of a perfect storm with regards to environmental contamination being transported thousands of kilometers away from where it's being used, deposited, and for many of these lipophilic contaminants being concentrated and magnified up the food chain for those top consumers or Inuit and Dene and Métis and Sami and other consumers in the circumpolar north to be exposed to much higher levels of contaminants than even many of their southern counterparts. So some of the work that I got involved in during my PhD was looking at this process of who gets to decide essentially what's safe and what's unsafe, the human health risk assessment process, and then also what is advised or what information is released to people um, with regards to supporting informed decision making in communities. For thousands of years, Inuit and other indigenous people around the Arctic have known from, or known from experience and from knowledge passed down through generations of what's safe to eat, what's good at what times of the year, what's good for women during pregnancy, the value of key items of traditional foods on the land, coming from the land, from the sea, and from fresh waters, and in many cases, um, from the air as well, from birds. Um, Yet there was this introduction of these invisible, tasteless, odorless, very essentially impossible to detect with the human eye, contaminant or hazard into a traditional food source that were putting individuals at significant risk because of this experience or the circumstance that they were living in. So we did a number of different research projects during my PhD and then since then around the role in place of indigenous knowledge in environmental health risk assessment, for example. Um, the perception of food safety and essentially getting a little bit into sort of medical anthropology of the traditional understandings of food safety, of what animals are able to be sensed as being healthy to eat and unhealthy to eat and what cues are being used from a traditional knowledge or an indigenous knowledge perspective. And then ultimately, how that information is being used, what's being communicated, how people are understanding that, um, and then how they're using that in their daily lives to make decisions. What are the impacts of that information in daily dietary decision-making among indigenous and non-indigenous residents in the Arctic, when in some cases, many of these messages are coming from much further south, um, from outside of the region, from a national health agency in some circumstances. What was coming up time and time again in a lot of that work was how things were changing. And what this got me interested in, in response in many cases to communities' requests and to communities' interest, was documenting or understanding better the changes in environment and how that was influencing health. The changes in competition among species, among traditional food species in the environment and how that was influencing health in terms of what was available at certain times of the year. The changes in environmental conditions that people trusted and relied upon to be able to hunt and travel safely, to be able to acquire those species for their family, for their extended family and community. And what that essentially was for myself was the introduction into and involvement into climate change as essentially a major disruptor to Arctic health in the circumpolar Arctic and as we know it, of course, or elsewhere around the globe. And similar to the contaminant story, we have a similar story with climate change where because of, and here what we've got in the two sort of global maps up at the top of the screen is the changes in average surface temperature observed from 1986 to 2005, so an increase up to 1.5 degrees Celsius and a little bit higher in some of the northern regions, 
And then projections from, two, uh, from 2081 up to 2100, where of course we're projected to move up towards you know, 1.5, potentially as high as two degrees average annual uh, uh, temperature uh, increase around the globe. But the circumstance that we have with climate change, we also had with contaminants where the polar regions are greater affected, where we have this issue of polar amplification of warming and of disturbance of the climate system having impact both in the north and in the south. And again, in the south, important for biological species and of course for researchers and other industrial activities going on in and around the Arctic and in Southern oceans, but critically important for human health and for human populations living in the circumpolar Arctic. What's important as well in the context of climate change is that we as humans, of course, don't interact with monthly averages. A monthly average temperature change of 0.1 degree or 0.2 degrees really doesn't mean that much to our daily activities, to our physiology, to our potential risk for for uh, issues related to exposure, heat or cold. But what climate change is doing as well is increasing the variability around that increasing average. So increasing or introducing new extremes. And that for people that are living very close in relationship to their local environment and living in already a relatively challenging environment in which they're making a livelihood um, on a regular basis, those sorts of changes mean quite a bit and can be quite important. And the picture on the bottom is just sort of a bit of a flow diagram of some of those complex relationships, both direct and indirect, between Arctic warming and variability around warming and some of the potential impacts on human activities and human health in the Arctic. One of the things we did in one of the projects I was involved in, if we're looking at variability to be increasing and projections to be for there to be a greater number of strange weather events and odd years, for example, is we looked at the last or the previous 2010 El Nino year in one of the communities where I work along the Northern Labrador coast in Nunatsiavut in the Inuit community. And we looked at both essentially the environmental conditions, but also then the human conditions. If these conditions are expected to happen more frequently in the future, from a health impact assessment perspective, what sorts of conditions are we talking about potentially occurring more frequently? And if we look at the graph on the left-hand side at the top, this is essentially the 25-year mean temperature, the 10, and then this anomalous year, this El Nino year effect. And if we were moving from the left to the right on the graph from January 1st, the Julian date, over to December 31st. What we see is a huge disturbance in that year, of course, that El Nino year in January and February and into early March. And if we look at precipitation during that same time, well, there's typically some precipitation at that time, often falling in snow once the, once the ice, the sea ice freezes up. But what we saw was a number of freeze thaw events and a significant amount of rain on ice. And what that results in is essentially these sorts of circumstances for travel, for hunting, and for safety on the land. The introduction of very significant environmental hazards that translate in potentially greater risks for injury and trauma on the land, for individuals pursuing livelihoods, having to get food, traveling to a cabin, or even traveling between communities. Increased need for things like search and rescue capacity in small, remote, isolated communities, which is something now that the Arctic Council is speaking about. And through that, and through surveys in the community, we were able to essentially document the perceptions and realities of the health impact assessment of these sorts of, these sorts of anomalous years. And with the projection that these may co reoccur in the future more frequently, what are the sorts of needs in the community to be put into place? So what that resulted in was a significant amount of activity around essentially human adaptation planning in the community and the development of some interventions, things like community freezers, where hunters that were frequent hunters on the land would capture or catch 
and donate some of their catch to a community freezer, a food hub in the community. That then individuals that didn't have the skills, didn't have the time, or in some cases, didn't have the equipment to get out on the land, particularly in more challenging environmental circumstances, would be able to still access healthy and safe and nutritious country foods or traditional foods from a community freezer as opposed to having to put themselves at greater risk going out in more variable and dangerous circumstances. Speaking about the intergenerational impacts of this, there was a project started in that same community in Nunatsiavut around trying to increase youth resilience to environmental variability, starting to increase youth skills and capacity to adapt with environmental changes going into the future. So a program that essentially was getting youth out on the land more often, and particularly youth that didn't have intergenerational connections with parents and with grandparents or elders to take them out on the land to teach them how to hunt and fish, those traditional skills, um, and safe travel skills, to provide them with that opportunity in more of a structured environment and connect them in the community with experienced hunters. So those sorts of interventions were outcomes of some of that climate change work that we're now continuing to follow to research the implementation of and also the evaluation of. A lot of the work you'll notice is related to this issue of people's connection to their environment through food. And of course, politically, what that has evolved into has been a focus on how we understand and how we talk about that relationship to food in terms of communities' difficulties in accessing safe and healthy and nutritious foods in Arctic regions. And that's specifically being captured by this concept or idea of food security. If we look back to 2011 in the Canadian Arctic, we had at provincial and territorial levels in the territory of Nunavut, 36% of the population identified as being food insecure. So on a regular basis, having challenges getting access to enough safe and healthy food. However, if we look at approximately around the same time, the closest comparator, if we look just at Inuit households in the territory at that time, that number jumps up to just under 70%. It was an introduction to me when we look at many of these issues, and it's a common theme in the global health literature and global health research, of course, is this notion of scale and how much scale in many cases masks this issue of inequity and of disparity between haves and have-nots, between those that are doing well and those that are significantly challenged within the same population, even though that population may have an average prevalence uh, level of a particular uh, circumstance that would not cause significant concern. Now, if we go back to the previous slide, that's still three times the national average, but this is nearly seven times the national average when we talk about food insecurity. This was a number that came out in 2002 uh, 11 or 2012, and was spoken about by the United Nations as being at that point in time, the highest reported level of food insecurity among an indigenous population in a developed country around the world, was here in a G8 country in Canada. So it was quite a wake up call to the disparity we had in some Arctic and Northern regions, and not exclusively, but very much sort of concentrated there with regards to issues associated with access to food. Colleagues that I work with and communities I have strong relationships with in Nunatsiavut similarly were then interested in looking at the diversity in their own region. Nunatsiavut is an interesting Inuit region in the Canadian Arctic because there's really only five settlements or five small communities. At that point in time, they had a food insecurity rate that had been assessed at just under 50%. They wanted us to look at the issue of food insecurity, but they wanted community-specific data. So we did that. And what we see in, even in a small region like Nunatsiavut, 
the, the southernmost community is about 50 kilometers or 60 kilometers away from a regional center being Happy Valley Goose Bay. There is a significant amount of disparity where the southernmost community, depending on how we calculate that number, is 22% food insecure, about twice the national average at that point in time. And the two northernmost communities actually were assessed at 83 and 79% food insecure. Significantly, significantly higher. Great diversity just within the region itself. What that did for us was highlight this issue of scale. It also highlighted this issue through conducting that work of how much really the regions are being served by the research and by the data that's being gathered to characterize, in many cases, some of these challenging environmental health circumstances. The tools that are being used and their appropriateness or their applicability in the cultural context and whether or not they have been validated in the cultural context in which they're being applied. And then essentially the follow-up, what's being done with the data and is it being used to improve circumstances as opposed to simply stigmatize populations. So in the context of food security, that work now has evolved very much into what you see on your screen. A lot of user-driven analysis, essentially not research focused from sort of a discovery perspective, but more essentially analysis that's being used to answer local questions. Excuse me, Chris, you yeah. have about one minute left. Perfect, thank you. Um, trying to look at the applicability of that tool and if it's, really if it's really capturing the conceptualization of what it means to be challenged in accessing food, both coming from the store and coming from the land in an indigenous context, potentially developing and adapting new tools for those contexts, then really using that data to support, to pilot and evaluate uh, local interventions. And then ultimately to look at the, the role of those interventions in improving that food security status. And finally, what we're trying to do now is to try and in, more con in a more concrete way, link those environmental influences and those environmental challenges that I started to speak about with really that assessment or that classification of household and individual food security status. So what I've learned through the research journey essentially that I went on leading into Arctic Health and becoming a member of sort of the Arctic Health community and now starting to interact more and more with my global health research community or research colleagues is really we need to enrich our Arctic Health research community with global health research thinking and global health thinking because many of the same themes are paramount in arctic communities and in arctic health research and in arctic environmental health research and we can learn a lot i think from one another and enrich each other's experiences and ultimately what we're trying to do i think is to learn with the best tools we have available to the best of our ability to support and promote health for the communities that we're working for. So I'll stop there and say thank you very much. Anakumi, merci, masi cho for those that may be joining us from the Western Arctic. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much, Dr. Fergal. That was uh, just such a, a wide swath uh, of of experience and uh, we certainly appreciate it and want to get down into some of the bit of nitty gritty here. Um, you mentioned uh, the experience of the Inuit, uh, of what that was like in their day-to-day -day lives, that that was what the focus of your research was. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about what would this, when you look at a family living uh, in the far north, what would you see that would let you know in their day-to-day -day lives that they were experiencing food insecurity? So we have some households and some communities where if I think of the, the northern coast of Labrador in Nunatsiavut, where I've been working quite a bit, where you have uh, um, out of that 
83% in one community, 79% in another community of being food insecure. About 25 to 30% of households being classified as severely food insecure. So individuals in that household having to skip meals on a regular basis, or in some cases go a full day, because the household doesn't have the resources to get enough to eat. So having to, in many cases, make choices and parents in, some, in many of those households having to make choices to eat less themselves or not have a meal to make sure that children were being fed. So it gets quite, uh, quite stark. Quite stark in many of those communities when we talk about severe levels of food insecurity. And this, and I, and I know it's an issue that, that sort of is touched on, I think, in one of the comments. Um, this brings up the issue of the ethics of even doing that research. Um, and it was something that we were challenged with quite a bit when conducting those assessments because we were not there, we were not you know, trying to, to insert ourselves into the food relief sort of network within the community. Um, we had to connect households with things like food support programs. But at the same time, it was very difficult to go to a household, assess it and find out the circumstances in the household. So we had to take some of those research dollars and start essentially sort of a, a healthy foods box where every household that participated in the project or in the survey also got sort of a, a box of, of food of sort of primary staples um, uh, that would last them you know, a few days um, in association with the project because otherwise we were running across so many households that were just in dire need of just basic calories uh, on a daily basis that it was very difficult to, you know, quote unquote, study that um, and, and sort of move to the next house or move to the next participant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that must have been uh, really challenging to experience that as a research researcher. Yeah, thank you for yeah, that. And, and particularly for graduate students as well that were involved in, in that work to see that and experience that. Um, and it sort of really sort of calls for the need for that sort of work, but that sort of work in a responsive manner as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question. Um, you you talked about uh, uh, working in Nunet's See that I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that properly. Um, how did you decide that that was the area that you wanted to focus your work in? Uh, I'm sure there are a number of different areas within the high Arctic where you could have gone. How did you choose that one? So Nunatsiavut is an interesting region in that if we go back to that one of those opening slides when I was saying which Arctic, it's actually left out of many of the Arctic Council boundary lines. Um, it's not until we start to look at sort of significant proportions of Indigenous populations that that line dips below and includes Nunatsiavut or the Inuit population living along the North Coast. So when I was doing my PhD, I was looking for uh, regions and communities that were um, dealing with those contaminant issues, were having to make decisions um, and were undergoing essentially an assessment process and they were one of those. And then also a region that was open to having research sort of support and, and inform some of that decision-making process. And oddly enough, um, I remember the first workshop that we held in, in Maine in Nunatsiavut and the director of the, of the health services at that point in time in the community, and then one of the, the mayor and then one of the leaders from the Inuit organization actually said to the team that was sort of coming together for the workshop, thank you very much for including us in an Arctic project. We're not often recognized as being Arctic communities in this region. So it's a combination of things. They were living in very similar circumstances, very facing essentially the exact same sort of circumstances as other quote unquote, sort of north of 60 and administratively Arctic communities still with a strong relationship to the land, of course, but just out of relationship as well. They were open and welcome and welcoming to having research um, essentially aid them and support them in some of the things that they wanted to do. And as a result, that has sort of lasted um, and continued a relationship and sort of a responsibility I have in that region with much of the work that I do as well. You mentioned earlier about ethics, and uh, I noticed when you were describing some fairly dire circumstances that 
that you remain fairly even keeled in your emotions. I'm wondering if you're always that way or if what you see generates some uh, anger or yeah. distrust or whatever those things happen to be for you. I wonder how you manage all of that. Well, and, and I can think of, for example, even my first time um, being sort of plopped into Arctic Bay, into Iqpiaryuk, um, I was, uh, it was a, a phenomenal sort of learning experience. Um, being very much sort of immersed living with a family and, and being out on the land and things like that. It, I would say that it was just as much sort of, uh, 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 of a, you know, a culture shock sort of coming to that community as it was leaving that community and coming south again. Um, in terms of being introduced sort of, you know, you know, right up front to the disparities and inequities that existed um, in Canada and um, between Arctic and, 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 and Southern communities, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous populations with regards to access, access to services and, and things like housing and basic public health infrastructure, for example. Um, and it did, it, it very much was quite enraging and quite sort of unsettling. Um, but it was also at the same time, sort of uh, uh, something that made me more passionate to sort of work, continue to work on those issues with the research um, that I do and, and with the faculty position that I have. There's a certain level, particularly as sort of publicly funded institutions, I think there's a significant level of commitment that we need to have to serve those communities that often aren't well served um, or that we don't pay enough attention to politically as a national or international population. So absolutely, there are things that are quite unsettling um, and but in the context of sort of speaking about them in in, uh, in the presentation, um, unfortunately, you know, you talk about them enough and they, they sort of come across uh, a little bit more objectively or neutrally. Well, I, I so that's definitely not the case. Yeah. Here's a, an interesting follow up question to that. Um, what are some of the solutions that you see improving food insecurity in these Inuit communities in particular? Uh, do you have any thoughts around community-based and community-driven solutions? So I'll just say that again for people listening. What are some of the solutions that you see improving food insecurity in these Inuit communities? In particular, your thoughts around community-based and community-driven solutions. So a great story um, associated with that very quickly is um, the federal government in Canada has what's referred to as the Nutrition North Program. It used to be the Food Mail Subsidy Program, where certain food items are subsidized for their transport to northern stores um, and being able to be offered at a more sort of economical cost, um, despite the, the, the heavy transport fees uh, and, and charges that exist for them. And often northern communities and northern regions are in this sort of fight with the government based on what's on that list and what's not on that list. How high the subsidy level is and how high the subsidy level is not. And I remember sitting on the plane with the Director of Public Health for the 14 northern Inuit communities in the province of Quebec in Nunavik. Um, and sitting on the plane coming back from Kujuak one time, and he said, you know, we are, we are caught in the wrong fight. We're arguing about the wrong thing. We're arguing about subsidy when we have so many local and regional resources that we're not making the best use of in today's world. We have so many households that aren't connected to the land. We have the riches of the land in many cases that we have always subsisted on previously that we're not essentially putting into a system where that's being distributed uh, effectively throughout the whoops throughout the uh, throughout the region or throughout the community and feeding those that are most in need. We can make such better use of our already existing resources, and that's what we should be focusing on, rather than arguing exclusively about a subsidy. So there are a number of sort of let's say formalization of traditional activities type uh, um, programs that are going on social entrepreneurship programs where or where regions are getting individuals paid to go out hunting, so providing opportunities for employment, 
And then that catch is being contributed to something like a community freezer, a local food bank, an elder's home, for example, to be feeding people with essentially some of the safest, some of the healthiest, some of the most nutritious and nutrient dense foods that exist in the region and not worrying about essentially the subsidy to try and lower the cost of a food that's being sold in the store. Mm -hmm. So the argument from many public health experts being those are really the sustainable ways towards the future with regards to much of these, many of these food issues is looking locally as opposed to looking at our transport infrastructure and our storage infrastructure and the subsidy uh, and the subsidy support that we're getting from the government. Are we doing the best we can with the resources that already exist? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, here, here's a question that I know you'll be able to answer within the four minutes that we have left. It's just a small question. Um, what are you hearing or noticing about the impact of COVID on uh, wildlife, uh, the impact on food, the impact on uh, potential areas of research that you might be interested in? So all of that in about four minutes, if you would mind. <laughs> oh, not a problem. Several <laughs> piece, of yeah. course. So. <laughs> So there's actually an, there's an interesting discussion group going on, a discussion and sort of community education group going on that's being led by Environment Canada right now on COVID and wildlife. Because there was a lot of information that came out in the news of potentially wildlife contracting and developing COVID and then potentially because of the human uh, uh, wildlife relationship with many indigenous groups throughout the North of is there the chance for essentially transmission to humans. And there's relatively little evidence that supports that, um, but I'm not an expert specifically in that area. So I would encourage people to get in touch with Environment Canada, or you can get in touch with me and I can connect you to this, uh, this working group. And actually one of the speakers in a few weeks, uh, Dr. Emily Jenkins, she'll be able to speak to that uh, as a veterinarian in a little bit more detail. So it's a great connection with, uh, with her talk as well. In terms of uh, COVID, the Northern uh, Medical Officers of Health have always been concerned about pandemic, about essentially infectious disease outbreak in the communities because the health system is already so stretched and already so frail in small, remote, isolated communities. Um, and we saw this, for example, in Nunavut, um, with one community with an outbreak in one community, um, and there being a great deal of concern um, in Nunavut for rapid spread, where we have a housing crisis and people essentially being forced to live um, in overcrowded uh, circumstances. So the, the conditions conducive there for, uh, for communication and for spread quite easily. So, however, it seems that, that sort of the territories and northern regions have been doing a relatively good job, sort of knock on wood, um, in, uh, in isolating and, and containing uh, uh, things. Um, in terms of research, it's like COVID research elsewhere. Um, in terms of what it's meaning for other research right now, there's a huge pause. So a lot of people are working on existing data sets. Um, and, and trying to do the most with what we can do. It's really sort of changing the nature of research in small communities. Um, but one of the things that it's going to do uh, as well is potentially start to identify what are the longer term impacts of sort of isolation in the community, cut off in the community in terms of resupply um, and sort of mobility from one community to the next and outside of the region that people traditionally have been able to benefit from um, and no longer, uh, well, at least for this period of time, uh, uh, have not been able to, to benefit from. So similar sorts of things are going to have to be looked at in terms of what the impact has been um, uh, 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 for these communities with regards to COVID. Okay, one last one, if we could sneak it in here. Yeah. You mentioned the importance of building a global health community that includes the Arctic. Yeah. Um, are there some other communities and environments from around the world that you might draw on to inform your research? Yeah, so there's really interesting connections that Arctic peoples themselves in global processes that they have been making connections with. One of the perfect examples is uh, uh, within, in and around the UNFCCC process or the United Nations Framework for the Convention of Climate Change process. 
Arctic indigenous peoples have cooperated and collaborated and connected with indigenous peoples in small island states to essentially raise their voice and increase their voice because they're facing similar sorts of environmental health threats with rising sea level, loss of access to resources, increased essentially environmental hazards for coastal and essentially for environment dependent indigenous populations. So it's, a, it's an obvious one where we do now start to see some research going on where we have sort of north to south connection and exchange. And many of the ideas of sort of, you know, uh, uh, local solutions, local adaptations that are taking place are concept or perhaps uh, uh, logistically quite different because they're in very different sort of climatological regions and eco zones, but conceptually very, very similar in terms of talking about human adaptation to climate change. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank you for just taking on any question that came up. That was really uh, sporting of you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and thank you for the excellent presentation and slides and, and uh, the insights that you've provided for all of us. And I'd like to thank everybody for contributing their compelling questions that, that kept Chris talking. Uh, it helped us to figure out what are the relationships between uh, what he was presenting and further thinking that you might be having. So thank you for those. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. And we look forward to hosting the third webinar entitled COVID-19, Human Health in the Arctic. And uh, take a special note here that this will be on Monday, February 27th, uh, 22nd, not the 15th, because that's family day here in Ontario, and we will all be relaxing. So it's Monday, February 22nd from 10 to 11. And that features Dr. Jennifer Spence, the Executive Secretary of the Sustainable Development Working Group of the Arctic Council. So that, again, another um, uh, well-attended uh, session we're anticipating. So we look forward to seeing you there. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. We look forward to your participation in the next webinar. Thank you and merci. Bye now.